we praise your name. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. If you have your Bibles, please turn to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, and the book of Proverbs, chapter 16. To all of our guests, welcome to Oneness Pentecostal Tabernacle. I hope that you are enjoying the worship with us. We are a congregation that loves to worship together and to lift the name of the Most High. Before we get into the text itself, I'd like to thank all the members of Oneness Pentecostal Tabernacle who have trusted me enough to allow me to pastor you. I do understand, you know, my calling is my calling. And so uh, there are times when I've got to be a little bit more firm than I and want to because there are certain needs in the body that demands that I take certain tact. But I want to thank you for allowing me to pastor you and those of you who actually listen to me, I, I thank you because I do see the movement and the grace of God in your life. We should always be hearers of the word. You know, hearers of the word. Let's get into the word. The book of Genesis chapter 3. Reading from verse 1. It says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were both opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, verse 25, states, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. Eternal God, I really need a revelation of your word. And Father, I speak to this entire congregation, and I ask that every heart be fertile, fertile ground, open to hear, and open, Lord, to receive your word. Lord, let souls be saved and delivered through this word. Allow your anointing to flow with power, fire, and anointing. Breaking, destroying every yoke and opening up every doorhouse, every prison, and letting go every captive. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today, I'd like to talk to you about pathways. Pathways. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man. 
And it seems I've been uh, for some time preaching along these particular lines, if you haven't notice these particular lines or I've been preaching uh, largely through the month of December that we should be careful that we become so overly spiritual that we are no carnal good or for the other side of it that we are so carnal that we are no spiritual good God has called us to the middle. And when you are in the middle, you have to be spiritual enough to touch God. But you've got to be so earth aware that you are aware of the people that are around you. Sometimes we can get so into the spirit that we want to soar into the heavens and forget about our main job that is here. We're living in perilous times, saints, and I speak this to our saints more so than to our visitors. And we have to be more sure of the word of God now than ever before because the Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that the serpent was subtle. Some of us, we are not going to slip into apostasy doing the things of the world. Some of us are going to slip in because we have misplayed and mishandled the word. Notice this in the book of Genesis chapter 1. There are principles that we have to hold on to before we get to bigger principles. I was going to be preaching today from the book of Galatians chapter 4 where it says that the hair as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant or a slave though he be Lord of all but he is under tutors and governors. He has to grow up until the time and until the time and when he is matured he is given and of course the process of maturing him any child that was destined for kingship got a rigorous education in warfare and our warfare is not about slaying demons. Our warfare is about controlling ourselves. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. When we speak about the weapons of our warfare, the helmet of salvation, salvation, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, these things are aimed directly at us to regulate the uncontrollable aspects of our lives. I was going to preach along that line, but I'm going to change and see how quickly I can begin to talk to you about pathways. The book of Genesis chapter 1. Anytime we start into the Word of God, we must build on principles. Everybody say principles. First principle that we discover in the book of Genesis, first chapter, first verse, is that God is preeminent. It is simply all of God's will. Second thing that we learn is that God's authority is preeminent. That no matter what darkness there is, whether it's self-generated or it is uh, there as a matter of course, when God's spirit begins to flutter and move or dwell across, everything must come into obedience of his authority. 
And notice when he speaks, all of a sudden things must come into being. Things not only come into being, but they come to their prescribed ends. The oceans and the seas cannot uh, usurp the authority and go on to the land. The land cannot usurp its authority and take over the position of the seas. The skies are divided and the waters above are divided from the waters below by the authority of God. And any time that we look for spiritual pathways in our lives, we must first settle in to discover what first is the authority of God. Of course, principle after that is serve and keep. You have heard me preach on serve and keep because the process of serving and keeping is the bedrock to how we discover salvation. Grace and mercy is a product of a serving and keeping God. The process of the church, his bride, is a process of us serving and keeping. And things that we serve and keep are both internal to our spiritual lives, to our lives as a body, to our relationship to him and to the rest of the world, as well as our relationship with each other. Anytime we do anything that usurps the process and the principle of us serving, keeping, and protecting each other, no matter what other gospel and doctrine that you lay on on top of that, it's going to crumble because you have not laid on a good foundation. The context of Genesis chapter 2 and 3 presents us with the dichotomy or a contrast of God's way versus man's choice. Here it is, we see the garden. Within Eden, this place of delectable delight, God creates a garden or a hedged about place. Gardens are places that are cultivated. Within this cultivated area, God grew every tree that is pleasant to the sight and which was good for food, including the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then God placed man into the garden to, as the scripture says in the King James Version, dress it and to keep it, or as we know it, serve it and keep it. The process of dressing and keeping is the process of serving and keeping. It is the Abad and the Shamar. And of course the Shamar is in of itself worship to God. The Shamar means to guard, protect, watch over. And the basic idea of this root is to exercise great care over. Anything that God puts into your garden, you have a responsibility to take care of it with extreme care. And within this garden, God has put the crown of his creative process. He put man. He has put him into this garden with the sole purpose of exercising great care and thereby giving praise and glory to God. Man, as we see, is in a state of innocence. The garden is a state of innocence. And the product of man's labor is the product of innocence. Thus, there is no evil present. What has never really hit me until now is the fact that God has commanded Adam to Abad and to Shamar over two things that were off limits to him. Adam is in the garden. 
God says, of every tree you can eat of except these two. There are two trees that you cannot touch. Rather, it doesn't say touch, but it says you cannot eat of. One is the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the second is the tree of life. Adam cannot eat of these trees, but he has a responsibility to these trees to maintain and care for them even though he cannot eat them because God's word is sacrosanct. And God commanded him that if you want to give true worship to me, you're going to have to take care of things that you cannot eat. The fact that these trees are off limits presents us with a interesting principle. If you're going to be happy, if you're going to find yourself in the will of God, if you're going to find purpose and God's will for your life, God is going to put things into your life that you cannot eat, yet demand that you have a responsibility to maintain to grow and to build these things. These things are sacred areas. The tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the tree of life were sacred areas in Adam's life. He had a responsibility to these sacred areas that demanded that he could not eat because in eating of the fruit, there was seed in the fruit. And every seed, though it looks good, may not be good for you until God says it's good for you. There are places, brethren, that need to stay off limits to the profane, the irreligious, and the ordinary. There are places and areas in our lives that need to remain sacred. And though we cannot eat, we must reverence the word of God by building and taking care of. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life. Needless to say, these trees are symbols of choices. We have choices. And our choices have values as to goodness as well as to evil. And we have a responsibility to guard what we do with our choices. God gave a command in the garden, but he also gave choices. And those choices are those things that are sacred. Your choices are sacred, saints. The choices that you make have importance, not only for the present, but for the future and for the world to come. Our choices, whether good or evil, are themselves a product of how obedient we are to God's word. It is God's word that defines what is the tree of knowledge, good and evil. It is the word of God that defines what is the tree of life. Notice, here is the irony. They had indirect accessibility to the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life because God was with them daily. As the scripture tells us that the spirit of God came down in the cool of the day and fellowshiped with them. As long as God was fellowshipping with them, they had knowledge. As long as God was fellowshipping with them, they had life. However, in this case, God is saying to them as well as us that seeking the trees of knowledge of good and evil outside of obedience to his word leads to death. Knowledge doesn't necessarily have to lead to death. But when it is given 
and it is reached by any other way but than God's word, it will lead to death. Therein lies this great conundrum, this puzzle, that God would put us over and in control of something that we ourselves cannot consume. We cannot consume it directly. But as long as we are in his presence, as long as we are in direct communion with him, the process of those, those things that he puts into our lives gives benefit to our lives because we are in obedience to him. It is a conundrum, secondly, because God has required as a part of our worship that there are parts of everything that he has given that we are responsible with our lives for, but seemingly have no possibility of using for our own purposes. Some things we cannot use for our own purpose because it's too hot. Some things will burn us. Why would God do so? What makes the scriptural retelling so interesting is this. What we think is the end goal is only the tools to get us to the end goal. You see, the end goal is obedience in God. God set up a garden, a garden of delectable delight and rest, and he puts Adam into the garden to do the strangest thing, work in a place of rest. What is he working at? He's working at worshiping God. And in the process of worshiping God, his worship is defined by his obedience to the word of God. The first tree represented the sum of knowing everything about everything. Have you stopped to consider what the tree is? It is a tree that gives one knowledge, information familiarity and awareness of both good, the noble, the virtuous, the blameless, and the wholesome, as well as the evil, the wicked, the malevolent, the foul, and the immoral. As God came down in the cool of the day, they had the ability to see the good in God. Yet, when we get to Genesis chapter 3, they were not just satisfied in seeing the good, the noble, the virtuous, the blameless, the righteous. They wanted to embrace the evil, the wicked, the, the malevolent. Their choice in the book of Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 7, was this. I want to know both the good and the evil of everything. It is a tree with one fruit. A fruit that makes one aware of both good and evil. And as I began to think about this, saints, you understand the good because you have fallen into evil. And because you have fallen into evil, you see as a contrapositive to the situation that you are in, the good that you can no longer embrace. And so the tree of knowledge of good and evil is a situation where you fall into evil, but can only see good and not touch good. Matthew chapter 17, 7 verse 17 says, Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So does this say that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was a bad tree? No. It was a good tree. But it becomes a bad tree based on what you do with the tree. 
It is a tree that gives knowledge, but not wisdom about everything. Saints, sometimes in our spiritual walk, we are searching for the depths of Christ. Sometimes in our spiritual walk, we get to places of ecstasy and excitement. We get revelations. Peter had to go caution people. Listen, what the Apostle Paul is talking about is good stuff. He has been places where you have not been to. The Bible speaks about, Paul said, he got up into the third heavens and saw things that were not lawful to be spoken of. And because they were not lawful, he did not speak of them. But the things that he spoke of them was so hot that Peter had to say, when you embrace what the apostle Paul is telling to you, what brother Paul is telling you, take care how you embrace it. Don't wrestle the scripture any further than what it needs to go. Because you will wrestle yourself into the pits of damnation. I'm already off my notes. This week, Bishop, I was looking at history of the heresies that have come down through the ages. Heresies come in two different flavors. Heresies come in the flavor in which you become so spiritual that you remove yourself from everybody else. The second flavor is the one where you become so spiritual that you prevent people from coming to Christ. Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they knew the scriptures and they prevented people from coming to truth. You become hyper-spiritual. The child of God cannot be hyper-spiritual because Christ was not hyper-spiritual. He was God incarnate, but he learned obedience and he submitted himself the mark of hyper-spirituality is when you cannot listen to elders in your life. You remove yourself from sound wisdom. Notice this. Genesis chapter 2. A man becomes whole when he cleaves to his wife and the two become one. She becomes his azur or help meet as help meet the Hebrew is azur, meaning that she is over and opposite him. And being over and opposite him, she sees things that are in his weak spot. So if she is over and opposite, it means she is standing this way looking at him. Looking at what he cannot see. And when they both work together, they have full vision of their weaknesses. Now, of course, the Bible speaks about uh, uh, individuals who have friends, two or three friends. Well, what does the scripture again tell us about two or three friends? There's counsel. In, there is counsel in the presence of two or three witnesses. Notice, it's very interesting as I... One falls, the other picks him up. Notice two or three witnesses or two or three friends allows one to get full vision in one's life. One spirituality should always be connected to other people. Why? Because we are in the body of Christ. Paul says submit yourselves one towards another. Because you see, I cannot be, I cannot move into the kingdom of God without you, and you cannot move without me. You see, the purpose of the Holy Ghost is one, to put you into the body. Secondly, to give you the power to work in the body. And then on top of that, God gives 
as a gift to the body, fivefold ministry, so that we come into the fullness of the knowledge and complete statute of Jesus Christ. So when you remove yourself from the body, when you become hyper-spiritual, you, you remove yourself from the Holy Ghost. Because the Holy Ghost is not going to go with you because the Holy Ghost stays in the body. The eye is not the body. All of this, all of, touch yourself all over. All of that is your body. So when somebody says to me that, you know, uh, I, you know, the Holy Ghost told me. My response to you is, well, when is he going to talk to me? Because the Holy Ghost cannot talk to you about doing something that is contrary to the word of God unless he speaks to the fivefold ministry. Unless he speaks to the elders into your life. Brethren, you must have elders in your life. The anointing flows down. Notice in the Old Testament. The problem with, with Solomon's son. Is that he listened to his friends and not the elders. The old man said, listen, your father put a weight on the people. Release some of the weights. His friend said, listen, you got to show yourself strong. Snap the whip. Come out like a man. And all of a sudden, two-thirds of the nation said, we're going in a different direction. Notice, any time we do not seek the will of God, we do not seek the counsel of God, we find ourselves in error. No. Bishop, you said something, and two-thirds. Scripture says, don't remove your neighbor's landmark. Because you may say it's your landmark, but it's also your neighbor's landmark. The person next to you, Whatever the foundations of the word of God that you've received in your life, don't shift them. Some things are settled in heaven and some things are settled in earth. And listen, we can bind things on earth, but it is not by individual power, but it is through the work of the eldership in the body of Christ. A threefold cord is not easily broken. So if there is something that needs to be shifted in the heavenly realm, it can be shifted here, but you can't shift it. And I can't shift it by itself. It has to be the elders. Those who are a part of the five-fold ministry working in concert with the Holy Ghost to make it shift. That's true. There's some things you don't need to touch. There's some things you don't need to mess with. If you see it, your job is to pray. Intercede and pray. That is the job of the body, to pray and intercede when there's trouble. And yes, there's all sorts of clouds of things that want to challenge the body. And let's be very frank about this. When you get into the book of Revelations, you will discover that in the church of Ephesus, devil set up shop. The devil sets up shop in revival churches and the devil sets up shop in weak, dying churches. Whatever kind of church we are, the devil is always going to be there because he knows whether we are alive or dead, that's where the action is. 
And so there is an apostolic process. And in this house, there are elders. There are prophets. And I thank God that God has allowed this congregation to have prophets. And to have evangelists. And teachers. And pastors. And fathers. And mothers. And if you're a mother in the house of God, you need to do the responsibility of a mother. Train up. And if you're a father in the house, you need to learn how to war in the spirit because men know how to fight. I've gotten so far afield of my message. But sometimes we, we've become so spiritual and we've become so hyper-spiritual that we either try to exclude ourselves from the body or we exclude others from the body. Christ doesn't exclude. And when you see the ministry of Christ, it was always in the marketplace where the evil people were, where the publicans were, where the Sadducees and the Pharisees were, where the weak, the poor, the rich, the feeble, that is where the people are and the work of the congregation. I do not claim that we are, quote, unquote, the church. We are part of the church. As Bishop Bernard says, we are a part of the church. The church is global. Our job is to be global. We don't segregate or separate ourselves because the work is where people who are in need are. And wherever the need is, we have a responsibility to reach out with bosoms of mercy to help. And so, there are pathways. We can either choose to honor the tree of knowledge, good and evil, or we can choose to eat of the tree of knowledge, good and evil. Saints, there's a reason why we filter information to the young, the immature, and the childish. The Apostle Paul speaks about, listen, I want to give you more solid things, but you're still on milk. You're still on milk. And you know, making the transition from milk to meat can be difficult. The reason why I'm wearing this microphone today is because I cannot pick up a mic. There are no, there's no strength in my arms to pick up the mic. Let me explain it to you. For the very first time, someone persuaded me to do something what my daughter could not persuade me to do, what my son could not persuade me to do. I'm a 50-year-old man. I have never done weight training. I've never. I have gone to export for the last 10 years. And I've only gone there to play basketball. I walk past all the weights. I, I pass. The most you'll see me on is an elliptical. Somebody persuaded me this week. Needless to say, there is a transition that has to occur between weakness, notice I'm holding my left arm for a reason. There is a transition that occurs between weakness and strength. Before, I was always comfortable not lifting weights because of my quickness. But at 50 years old, 200 pounds, I am no longer quick. I still want to play the game. But I'm frustrated when young guys roll by me. All of a sudden, I can't play defense like how I used to play defense. And so I made up in my mind that I'm going to have to do some weight training. Hence, I am suffering.
There is this pain transition to get to the place of strength. And if you move from milk to meat, your stomach has to change the way that it digests soft things to hard things. And if you move from a state of not lifting weights to a place where you are lifting weights, muscles have to be torn, things have to be stressed, and you have to suffer a while. Your suffering does not mean that that, that is the definition of all truth. It isn't. It's just your reality in that particular moment. Your reality should not become everyone else's body uh, problem if it is not in the word of God. Everything should be biblically based. Because without the word of God, and, and, and this word is very clear to this, it says, listen, if you add the last book, last verse of the chapter, says if you add anything to this prophetic word, then what's already in this, all the curses in this book, comes on you. If you take away, you will find yourself into a situation where your life can be taken out of the book of life. And so it is very important that some things have to be concrete in our lives because if they are not concrete, we find ourselves flapping in the wind. We are living in a postmodern world. This is postmodern. The hallmark of postmodern world is that you question everything. Cynicism is abundant. You, you think that the, 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 uh, the, 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 the scene that we see in the political world is by chance? No. It is the spirit of the age to question everything. It is the it is a spirit of anarchy. It is the spirit of the Antichrist. And out of that, we get the, se the, the sense of pluralism. Uh, and with pluralism, my truth doesn't have to be your truth. And then it leads to another spirit called centralism, centralism where you, you define by your own actions your truth. So you are self-referencing yourself. Well, if you self-reference yourself and you are in error, how are you going to get out of error? If garbage in, for those who are programmers, you put garbage into the program, aren't you going to get garbage out of the program? So the word of God has to be the fulcrum of our lives. The word of God has to be the defining moment. And the thing that settles us. And the word of God, everything in the Old Testament is a type or a shadow that builds us, leads us to the revelation of Jesus Christ and the revelation of his church. Saints, the, it's all about Jesus and his church. And if anything takes you away from Jesus or the church, it can't be good. John speaks in the book of Revelations. Watch out for the spirit of the Nicolaitans. The spirit of the Nicolaitans is spirit of I have power. Power of the people. We have to be very careful of what we put before our eyes. And normally, when you hear that from the pulpit, we're always thinking about things that are bad, things that are carnal, things that are pornographic, things that 
erode our sense of being. But there's also another side of things that you've got to be very careful about. And this was hammered into me when I was at, because of the times, Brother Shock spoke to the preachers saying, listen, there's some good books out there, but just because it's a good book doesn't mean that it's a good book for you for the particular moment. Truth and knowledge is for the time needed. If it's not the proper time, you find yourself in trouble. All prophecy is not for any particular, it is only for the specific moment. And so, I remembered that this week, and I went on Amazon, and I started looking, I wanted to see what kind of books were out there in the Christian realm. The largest category of books in Amazon is about demonology, spiritual warfare, destroying yokes, etc., etc., I sat back and I had to ask myself this. If you are living a spiritual life, why do you need a book to go fight demons and spirits? Brethren, Jesus never fought demons and spirits. Jesus went about doing his ministry. And in doing ministry, Things revealed themselves, and he did not fight with them. He just spoke to them. Come out. Come out. I do not fight with spirits when they manifest themselves. I use the word of God because I have authority. You have to understand and you have to embrace the authority of the word of God. Because you see, everything has to stand on his word. There is nothing higher or greater than the authority of God because it stands on the character and nature of who he is. And because God is God by himself, all other things must look on in obedience and recognition of his nature. And so, because of his classes and his nature, he sets the law for what is law. He sets the law for what should be and what should not be. Notice, Jesus is brought into the wilderness to be tempted, the thing he does is quote scripture. And be very well aware that the devil knows how to quote it too. So that means you need to learn your word, word for word. There's a very interesting book that and I'm going to be coming to a close because I did not even get into the message. Think fast, think slow. Think slow, think fast. And this is based on neurology. There are two states to our brain, thinking fast and thinking slow. We think fast when we're in a rush. We think fast when we are in danger. When we are thinking fast, it is not deep thinking. It is light thinking. It is what we do to get over the hump to another day. Because it is fast, what we do is we don't think through all the processes. We use past experiences to create silos of information that we hierarchically put together into a tree that gets us to a result. That result may not be perfect, but it should save our skins. Slow thinking, on the other hand, is what we do when we dig deep down and we allow the word or whatever it is to sink into us and we know it with every fiber of our being. 
When we have done that, we have gone through all permutations. We've gone back and front, inside and out, and whatever choices we make from there is solid. I have discovered that I have a tendency when it comes to the Word of God to read the Word of God fast as opposed to slow. And because I do it fast as opposed to slow, there are certain scriptures that I flub up on. don't recall off the top of my head, but in the book of Isaiah, it speaks about the lamb and the, the lion and the lamb. You say it's the lion and the lamb? It, the Bible actually says it's wolf. It's not lion and lamb that's going to lay down. It's the lamb and the wolf. I had to sit down, Sister Easington, and wonder, wait a second. What, what has been, what it really is, is that lion and lamb sounds a whole lot more balanced than lion and wolf. And so it's an easier way for me to memorize the scripture by replacing a wolf with a lion. They both are bad, but the scripture says wolf. And because we do that, we slip up with doctrine. Doctrine is for what purpose? For instruction? For reproof? For correction? For righteousness. And so our outlook on the word of God has become twisted because instead of absorbing the word, meditating on the word, the apostle, David always encouraged, I will meditate. The word of Lord is, is, is a light unto my path. Because we do not meditate the word of God properly, there's a disjuncture between what the word is truly saying to us and where it is bringing us and to what we have embraced as being truth. And so, there's a pathway that seemeth right to a man. But the end is death. It's very interesting when I looked at that verse. Proverbs says that verse twice. It repeats itself word for word. There is a way that seemeth right but just because it seems right doesn't mean it is right. And Paul says prove and test. And if you prove and test, it means that you've got to use all your spiritual senses. We as Christians, we're into the vision thing. The brighter the vision, oh, it's got to be more spiritual. But Paul encourages us to hear. Hear, not see, hear. Why? Because you use two senses when you hear. Sense of balance and sense of hearing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Hear. Let him hear. Why? Because you need balance in hearing. There has to be balance in how you embrace the word of God. Hear. Don't see. Hear. Everyone's looking for, I called it on Friday, the matrix. Everyone wants matrix spirituality. Have any of you seen the movie Matrix? All of a sudden, lights and fire and spokes start all over the place, and all of a sudden, People start doing strange things that are, no. Spirituality doesn't work like that. Let me say this. Spirituality is day to day. It is what we do in the ordinary. 
It is what we do when people are not seeing us. It is what we do when we are by ourselves. So it's not all those sorts of things that people are advocating on news and TV and radio and so forth like that. It's how we represent Christ in our day-to-day -day living. And so I end by saying there is a pathway that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. I'd rather we choose life, saints. I would rather we choose to walk in the revelation of Jesus Christ. I would rather us stay in the body together, working with each other in the body, because it is the will of Christ. If we make it, we make it together. Do you know that's going to be a part of your testimony? That has to be a part of your testimony. That you made it helping other people make it. Your spirituality, you cannot make it to the rapture walking over people. This is not the crab in the, in the barrel spirituality of the world we rise together the church is so that we rise together and there was revival in the acts 2 church because they had everything common i open up this altar for a moment of reflection I open up this altar because God is speaking to somebody that you're about ready to make a decision and you're going to choose a pathway that may not be the right pathway. I'm the bishop of this church. He started this church when he was just seven years old. Now, the other day it was so interesting. We had to do a little business and uh, to get a, what you call it, a ring over here. Oh, power of attorney. No, not power of attorney, when you have the certified stuff. Oh, notarized. Notarized. And when I got over there, he said, sit down here. Now, I, wherever I went, when he was a kid, he had to go. Now, they say, once a man, twice a child. So now he says, sit down here. And I'm saying, wait a minute. You know, this is a reverse situation here. He's telling me, sit down here, sign here. That's the way it works. Now, he's the senior pastor of this church. Although I'm a presbyter, I'm a part of the governing body of the New York Metro District. I'm presbyter for this section, which include Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk. He is the pastor of this church. And so when I come here, I submit to him because he's the pastor of this church. If I have a situation, I talk to him. I said, so and so and so and so. And the scripture says we have to individually submit yourself one to another. Exactly. Because, yeah, the eye is not the body. The mouth is not the body. The feet, not the body. The church is a many-membered body. Yes. And so God is the one who places us in the body. Wherever he placed. puts you, wherever he places you, put. it's his pleasure. It's his pleasure. It's his pleasure to put you there. And place you. And if your foot begin to act like your hand, your hand, there's going to be a problem. So if God allows you to be the toe, like the big toe,
Don't you know, understand that the big toe, the great toe, serves a very, very important part for the body? It Remove your big toe, you have no balance. So wherever God places you, you stay there because you're important in the body. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm important in the body of Christ. Wherever God places you, that's where you stay and function. Function. You've got to function. I said you got to function. Function. You know, Pastor, while you was preaching, you talk about boundaries. God created the seas and the oceans. Yes. And he put boundaries there. He put, boundaries. He put a boundary there. So the ocean cannot come over into the land. Exactly. Now, God can send a tsunami. But you see, boundaries is important. And that is an apostolic word. Because on the other side of it, yes, I am the senior pastor, but I make sure I have pastors in my life. That's one of my pastors. That is my pastor. And I make sure that I have elders in my life because I don't know everything. And I need somebody to talk to when I can't talk to my wife. And there are a lot of things that happen in the body that I cannot talk to my wife about. And so, I've got to have pastors that pastor me. I've got to have elders that lead me. Otherwise, I will go crazy. I will go crazy. Or I will go off the deep end. And I want to say this so that you can understand it one more time. The words of the Apostle Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. And you know I'm following Christ by my testimony. And if my testimony shifts, you know I'm not in the body. Don't follow me. I open up these altars. If you're here, church. This is an apostolic church. Whenever there's revival, you're going to have all kinds of situations happen. This note is Brother Saunders. They're taking him to the hospital because uh, we need to stand and pray for him right now that God will intervene. Come on now. Let's all stretch forth our hands right now. Special prayer for Brother Saunders. Let's we'll take him to the hospital. Blood pressure. And all right, so let's pray. And you know God is able. You see when the body begins to go out and kill things happen. Make sure you function in the body. Father God, in the name, name of, Jesus, of Jesus, Lord, we come. You who said all things will work together for good to them who are the call according to his purpose. Oh my God, it's by your stripes that we are healed. Lord Jesus, my God, you love the world in such a way. You went to Calvary. You laid down your life, Lord, to save us. Father God, I'm asking you to remember our brother this morning. Stretch forth your mighty hand, Lord. Bring that pressure down by the authority of the word of God and the power of Jesus' name. I speak against, I speak against that infirmity right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, it shall be so according to the word of God. Even right now, Lord God, there are those who are even sick right now in the body and need a touch from you. Stretch forth your hand right now to heal. Oh, Jesus, stretch forth your hand to heal in the name of Jesus Christ. We give you the praise. We give you the praise. These altars are open right now. These altars are open in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Lord, here I am. The word of God is about the Bible. It's about the church.